Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the Divine Mercy Sunday today. Uh, for those that are watching or not familiar with what this feast day is, I'm going to give you a brief uh, description of what we're talking about. And then I just want to share some stories of mercy uh, with you today. So, St. Faustina, um, in her diary... Uh, Diary of St. Faustina, she wrote, she wrote what the Lord told her. And uh, for my Protestant evangelical friends, uh, the best way to explain this would be that she was getting prophetic words from the Lord. And, you know, a lot of people claim to get prophetic words from the Lord. But in the Catholic Church, uh, we have mystics and there's a lot of false mystics, just like there's false prophets in the Protestant Church as well. Uh, in fact, one of my guests on the show, uh, Father Joseph Ianuzzi, who uh, is an exorcist priest, a very spiritual priest, and also a very intellectual theologian in the church. I uh, actually did a video on Armor of God, I recommend, where it exposes a lot of these false mystics. You know, so I usually don't pay attention to the mystics unless the church says, yes, these people are mystics and they're hearing from God. And St. Faustina not only is a mystic, that we can take her word, uh, but she was also canonized by Pope St. John Paul II. So just a brief description. The best description I can give you is on the back of this book. It says, shortly before the outbreak of World War II, a simple, uneducated, young Polish nun receives a special call. Jesus tells her, I am sending you with my mercy to the people of the whole world. I do not want to punish mankind, but I desire to heal it, pressing it to my merciful heart. Jesus also tells her to record his message of mercy in a diary. This is the diary. You are the secretary of my mercy. I have chosen you for that office in this and the next life. Now, she's an uneducated, very simple girl. And the church recognizes what she's saying. It's like deep theological stuff. Very powerful theological uh, writings. This is how we know it was from God. One of the many reasons. These words of Jesus are found. Though she died in obscurity in 1938, Sister Faustina was hailed by Pope John Paul II as the great apostle of divine mercy in our time. On April 20, 2000, the Pope canonized her as St. Faustina, saying that the message of divine mercy she shared is urgently needed at the dawn of the new millennium. So, Pope... St. John Paul II, uh, II not only um, made her a saint, he also declared that the Sunday after Easter, Divine Mercy Sunday. So a brief description of what it is. Uh, okay, so in a series of revelations to St. Maria Faustina Kowalska in the 1930s, our Lord called for a special feast day to be celebrated on the Sunday after Easter. Today we know that feast as Divine Mercy Sunday, named by Pope St. John Paul II at the canonization of St. Faustina on April 30, 2000. The Lord expressed his will with regard to this feast day, his, his very first revelation of St. Faustina in her diary, entry 699, and I'll, I'll read that in a minute. In all, St. Faustina recorded 14 revelations from Jesus concerning his desire for this feast. Nevertheless, Divine Mercy Sunday is not a feast based solely on St. Faustina's revelations. Indeed, it is not primarily about St. Faustina, nor it's altogether a new feast. The second Sunday of Easter was already a solemnity as the octave day of Easter. The title, Divine Mercy Sunday, does, however, highlight the meaning of the day. So, quickly, what the Lord showed her, I'll read... Uh, her paragraph 367, I actually just opened up to this one. I was like, wow, this is perfect. And then I'll read 699, that reference there. And then I'm going to share some powerful stories of divine mercy in real life situations. My heart over, this is the Lord talking to St. Faustina. My heart overflows with great mercy for souls and especially for poor sinners. If only they could understand that I am the best of fathers to them. And that is for, and that is for them that the blood and water flowed from my heart, as from a font overflowing with mercy. 
For them I dwell in the tabernacle as king of mercy. And then this is where the Lord told her that he wants to have a feast day for mercy, to focus on the church, to focus on his mercy and understand his mercy. And, and when you go to confession on Divine Sunday, it's, it's a powerful, it's, it, you know, all confession is powerful and God's mercy is always there. But on Divine Mercy, you receive just a special outpouring of grace, even more so. So it's very important. My daughter, tell the whole world about my inconceivable mercy. I desire that the Feast of Mercy be a refuge and shelter for all souls, and especially for poor sinners like me. Well, for me, I add it. On that day, the very depths of my tender mercies are open. I pour out a whole ocean of graces upon those who approach the fount of my mercy. That was like in the 1930s, Pope St. John Paul II made it a feast in 2000. And to me, you know, the verse... That verse always comes back to me when I read about God's mercy and his love for the world. The verse that kept me from becoming a Calvinist when I was a Protestant for many years. The verse that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. John 3.16, but it doesn't end there. John 3.17 says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it rather. See, our sin already condemns us. Our sin condemns us to hell. Jesus came to save us from our sin. And he has victory over death and sin. That's the victory that he gives us. Now, before I get into some of these stories, I just want to read a short little thing that um, Pope St. John Paul II said when he made this proclamation. This proclamation, this confession of trust in the all-powerful love of God is especially needed in our time. When mankind is experiencing bewilderment in the face of many manifestations of evil, the invocation of God's mercy needs to rise up from the depths of hearts filled with suffering, apprehension, and uncertainty, and at the same time yearning for an infallible source of hope. That is why we have come here today in order to glimpse once more in Christ, the face of the Father, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation. And he gets that verse, he gets that saying, the, the, the God of all consolations from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. And we need to dive into that because this is what it's all about. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 7, I'll read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Uh, some of the older versions say uh, consolation. Consolation and comfort meaning the same thing. This version says comfort. Um, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Why? So we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort with which we received ourselves. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. Yeah, we're going to suffer. We're going to share in his sufferings. You want to follow Christ? We don't just live in the resurrection. We live in the crucifixion. But we glory in the resurrection. But we can't appreciate the resurrection without the crucifixion. That's why in every Catholic church, we have a crucifix and we have an empty cross. Because grace is free to us, but it costs Jesus his life. And we need to never forget that. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. We know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. And you see that through the scriptures. God's mercy. Jesus' mercy. on the woman at the well who went to the well in midday because in the morning when all the other women went, they, they would make fun of her. They hated her. They would shun her. She wasn't accepted because she was a sinful woman. But Jesus meets her where she's at. 
And besides from the apostles, she's the first person in history to hear Jesus say he is the Messiah. And she becomes our first and greatest evangelist, our first missionary, the woman at the well, who we remember as St. Fatina today. The adulterous woman who they wanted to condemn. And Jesus says, I do not condemn you. Go and sin no more. Peter, when he denied three times, was showing mercy. Doubting Thomas, he couldn't believe. So Jesus didn't say, you loser, you don't believe. He says, oh, you need to see my holes? Feel my holes. And then as my priest told us today, who's from India, Thomas went to India and was martyred for the, for the cross. And this is why my priest is here today, a priest loving Jesus from India. I can go on and on about the mercy of God, you know, delivering Mary Magdalene of seven demons, and she becomes one of the greatest saints in the church. The woman, the sinful woman that was washing his feet, and the Pharisees were appalled. How could you touch? How could you let a woman touch you? She's unholy. She's filthy. She's got dirty hands, and she's touching your feet. Ill. And Jesus said, to whom much is forgiven, they love much. And that woman loved her because she had an encounter with him. And you can imagine these saints throughout history, the woman at the well, um, the adulterous woman, the woman washing his feet, they suffered like we're all going to suffer. But they were comforted because they encountered Christ. And that's what Christians do. And that's why we suffer, so we can receive his comfort. You know, the difference between followers of Christ and follower of the law, rule book, and, you know, memorizing the laws and the, and, and the rules we have an encounter with Christ. So the law is written on our heart. His Holy Spirit is in us. The love of Christ is in us. So we can't help but telling people how much Jesus loves them. We just can't, even if we try, <laughs> even if we're mad. <laughs> the love of Christ will always come out, as I'm going to show you in these stories. You know, St. Faustina, who was on the verge of World War II, you know, and, you know, we got it great these days compared to these people that went through World War II. You know, what everybody's husband went away for years and many of them didn't come back. Everybody's fathers went away for years and then come back. Some of them didn't come back. It was a brutal war. There was so much sin. The Nazis were so evil. They brutally butchered and tortured over six million innocent Jews. And yet, in this great evil, great mercy arose. You see, because the Bible says... Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And you see the church, the Catholic church, saving over 900,000 Jews. You know, during the time of World War II, a lot of people were, were you know, good thing there wasn't YouTube, because there would probably been Catholic YouTubers getting rich on this one, saying uh, the Pope was uh, siding with Hitler because the, the church took a stance of neutrality, and the Pope kind of stayed quiet about everything. But he did it because... The agreement was stay neutral and we won't go into your churches. So the Catholic Church hid and saved over 900,000 Jews, way more than Schindler. Even though Schindler was a great man and did great things, the church did much more. And the state of Israel gave our Pope the highest medal you can give. And um, actually, the chief rabbi, I believe his name is Rabbi Zoli, converted to Catholicism because he's seen the mercy of the Catholics mercy of the Catholic Christians. And what was that mercy? Many priests died trying to save these Jews. And, and the most famous, the most famous priest that gave his life, although he didn't die straight up for a Jew, he died for a Polish man. He was thrown in prison because he was hiding the Jews and, and fighting against the Nazis. And he was caught and he was thrown into a Polish concentration camp. And the, and the Nazis hated him because he would share his food with all the starving uh, prisoners. So they would keep giving him less food, but he kept sharing his food. And then one day, 13 prisoners escaped, I think, maybe 12 or 13. I know it was at least 10. So the Nazi guard said, 10 men escape, so 10 men will die. And they just randomly went, you, 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 picked like 10 men. Said, you will go into the starvation bunker and you will starve to death. It will be a painful and brutal death. And one man who, uh, 
had a wife and kids, cried and said, what about my children? What about my wife? And Father Maximilian Colby felt mercy and showed mercy and said that a Nazi, can I die in his place? Can I go in his place? And they were glad to accommodate him because they hated that priest. So they said, sure. And one of the um, people that were in there was tasked with cleaning the bunker, you know, taking their urine. Sell, sells a tale that the urine bucket was always empty because they would drink the urine, they were so thirsty. And he said he always seen Father Maximilian Col Colby comforting and praying with everyone. And at the, at the end, he would pray with them and lead them into glory, lead them to Jesus. And he was still alive when everyone was dead. So the Nazis came in and said, uh, we need this bunker. And they gave him a shot of poison and he died. And it reminds us there's no greater love than a man lay down his life for a friend. Saint Maximilian Kolbe was able to comfort others because he knew Christ. He had an encounter with Christ and he was comforted by Christ. He was able to love them because he knew the love of God. If you see his writings when he was a free priest, this guy knew Jesus. This guy was filled with Jesus' love. So he was able to lay down his life. And during this time of war, uh, the Nazis occupied Rome. And again, we had this truce where they put a big circle around the Vatican and they wouldn't go in. But that didn't stop our courageous priests and Pope from hiding Jews in the Vatican. I think we hit over 2,000. But not only that, there was a tough Irish priest named Father O'Flattery. And uh, what he did to work out was box. He loved the box. He was a tough, tough old Irish priest. And when Americans and Germans and French and Italians, you know, were shot out of planes or whatever, and they were, you know, they're being hunted by the Nazis, he had set up a pipeline, bring them through the Vatican and get them free. And they also did this with Jews, it's through this pipeline to free them, get them through the Vatican and get them free. And then when the Americans came rolling in, liberating Rome uh, and caught the Nazis, the lead, the leader of the Nazis asked Father O'Flattery for mercy. He said, listen, they're gonna put me away in jail forever. I don't know what they're gonna do to my wife and kids. You know, you always talk about mercy, Father. And I know you got this pipeline. Could you get my wife and kids out? And Father O'Flattery said, you butchered and murdered my priest? You butchered and murdered so many innocent souls and you want mercy from me? And like many of us do, we get passionate, you know. Many of us guys, we get passionate. Father of Flattery said, you could go to hell and walked away. And the Nazi said, yeah, you're no different than me. But then why, why the Nazi was being interrogated by the Americans, they're like, we know about this pipeline. Tell us about this pipeline. He's like, I know nothing about this pipeline. He's like, well, your wife and children apparently went through this pipeline. Where are they? And then the Nazi realized that even though the father was mad, the father was different. He knew the mercy of God. And it said that Nazi spent the rest of his life in prison. He died in prison. And he had one visitor every month, month after month, year after year, until he died. And that visitor was Father O'Flattery. And in 1959, that Nazi repented and was baptized into the Catholic Church. This is the power of mercy. You know, this is the power of mercy. And, you know, God's mercy is so great. It's not just for us Catholic Christians. I know this because I was a Protestant Christian for 30 years. And I was the most worst sinner that you would want to know. You wouldn't want to know me. Before I came to Christ, I was a different man and Christ's mercy came to me. And even in World War II, Christ's mercy came through our Protestant brothers and sisters. Great story. Uh, the book or the movie, I recommend them both. The Hiding Place about Corey Ten Boone and how her family, I believe they were German or Austrian, and they hid Jews and they got caught and they were thrown into a concentration camp and they were all killed. Except Corey, who was scheduled to be killed, but somehow by a miraculous paper slip up, she was freed and she forgave those. She literally went to those who killed her parents and forgave them. 
And she says this, she was a little child in Auschwitz, I believe. She was a little child in a prison camp watching people get killed. And she can honestly say, no matter how deep your sorrow is, no matter how deep your despair, no matter how deep in sin you are, the grace of God, the mercy of God is deeper still. You know, and even beyond that, on the streets of New York, another evangelical pastor that I adored, Pastor David Wilkerson, felt called to minister, felt called to minister to these street gangs. And the leader of the biggest gang at the time, Nicky Cruz, leader of the Mau Mau's, every time he told them that he loved them because he knew this guy had no love. This kid never knew what love was. He could tell this kid didn't know what love was. So he had to tell him, I love you with the love of the Father. You know, Christ is in us and we're called to love as, as Jesus loved. So he would say, Nicky, I love you. And Nicky would get so angry and beat him up. And Nicky Cruz recounts the last time Pastor Wilkerson said, Nicky, I love you. He said he got so angry, he beat him almost to death. He beat him so bad that Pastor Wilkerson was on the ground full of blood. And he pulled out his switchblade and put it next to his face and said, Do you tell me you love me one more time? I cut you up into a thousand pieces and spread you all over Manhattan. And David Wilkerson with blood on his face said, Nikki, you could cut me up into a thousand pieces. You can throw my body all over Manhattan and every piece will shout out, Nikki, I love you. This is the power of mercy. Nikki couldn't handle and Nikki ran and he kept running and he ran into the arms of God eventually, repented, fully repented, went to the cops, gave him his drugs, gave him his weapons. And 200 of his gang members followed. And the New York City police said this was unbelievable. They're just coming in, giving me heroin, giving me guns, giving me knives. This is the power of mercy. And of course, I'm a Catholic Christian. And I want all my Protestant brothers to come to the fullness of the faith. But I know God still loves them. God still works in them. God still shows them mercy like he shows us mercy. But the greatest mercy, when Jesus came, he was in heaven. He left heaven. Our goal is to get to heaven. He was there. And he left to, to be at the mercy of us. And we weren't very merciful. We killed him. We crucified him. My sin and your sin crucified him. And as we were crucified him in wretched pain, he didn't tell us to go to hell. He said, you know, and, and when you're crucified, you die by suffocation. That's why they break their legs because then they can't, because they try and hold themselves up so they don't suffocate. So they want to kill them quicker. They break their legs. But Jesus was the perfect lamb and the perfect lamb that gets sacrificed has no broken bones. So he was dead before they went, before they were able to break his legs. But as he's suffocating and he looks upon those that are laughing at him and mocking him, me and you crucify him. He says, Father God, Father God, forgive them for they know not what they do. That is the ultimate mercy. And just like the unbelievers in his day would say, how could that be God? I see him. He's a human being. He's the son of Joseph and Mary. He's just a human being. He can't be God. The doubters today look at him in the Eucharist and say, how could that be God? That's bread. That's a wafer. When Jesus said, this is my flesh. This is my body. Jesus wants to be with you in such a close personal way that you can eat his flesh and drink his blood. This is what Jesus wants. Doesn't make sense to our worldly mind. But I'm telling you, I've had a personal relationship with Jesus for 30 years. I was filled with his Holy Spirit at 19 years old. And then when I so so I knew, so I recognized the Eucharist, that he was in it when I came as a, as a Christian 30 years later and became Catholic. And when I eat his flesh and drink his blood, I'm closer to him than I've ever been. And this is why I want all my brothers and sisters to become Catholic He's there saying, I love you. Come to the table. Stop eating the crumbs. Come to the supper of the lamb. You can have a part of heaven today at the table, at the communion table, the Eucharist. He's not some symbol. It's really him. He said, this is my flesh. This is my blood. And just like in John chapter six, many of his followers couldn't believe it. And they walked away. Many today don't believe it. Believe it. It's real. Jesus meant what he said. And he said what he meant. And on Divine Mercy Sunday, what a day to receive his body and blood. So God bless and stay Catholic.